Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Zephron Olive, and it's time for a super special video. So, Corsa 2019 is officially spoiled. We're going to have pre-release this weekend, the set release the next week. So it is time to talk about the best cards from the set for various formats. And we are kicking things off with one of my favorite videos every set release. And that is the Commander Top 10 with very special guest, Tomer. How's it going today, Tomer? I'm doing well, Seth. I don't know if I'm a special guest anymore, though. Yeah. We're doing this every single set. <laughs> uh, it, you're, it's still special to me, because I look Aww. forward to it, and it's always so much fun. I look so. forward to it, too. This is my favorite <laughs> video to record. Well, one of my top three favorite videos to record. And you do three video series, right? Uh, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> All right, so we're going to be talking at 2019 today with the top 10 cards. And like usual, uh, Tomer made this list. And this is kind of like cards that you like, not necessarily the spikiest, most competitive commander card. So, Tomer, before we jump into the cards, what is your impression of Core Set 2019 for Commander overall? How good or bad is this set for the format? So, it's kind of weird because my initial impression of the set was kind of underwhelming. Like, we just came off Battle Bond, and we just came off Dominaria, and that came with a lot of good commander cards. Especially like Battle Bond, like it's meant for multiplayer. Um, so I looked at M19 and these were just cards not geared specifically towards Commander and I was kind of underwhelmed. But then when I was doing the review, I realized there's just as many, if not more cards that I'm actually excited to play with than I would say Dominaria. Dominaria had probably a higher quantity and they were focusing more on Commander, but there were a lot of cards that clearly were made for Commander that I don't really care to play with. Um, and M19, however, doesn't have a huge quantity, uh, the same quantity as Dominator or Battleborn, but the the cards they did bring to the Commander are probably going to make a bigger impact, I would say. Yeah, I think that they did a really good job, and I think they've been consistently doing a really good job with making sure that every single set has some Commander goodies. And just looking over this list... There's a lot of really cool things on this list. We get legends that can be sweet commanders and the elder dragons. We get some sweet support cards, some tribal support. So I feel like Wizards has just really been knocking out of the park very consistently with Commander. I feel like every time we do one of these top 10 lists, we're talking about how Wizards made another good Commander set. And we've been having that happen for like a year now. So good job, Wizards, with uh, Commander cards, I guess. Yeah, I think just over the years, they're just more and more getting into Commander themselves. And as they do that and they focus their attention on Commander more and more, we just get to reap the, the benefits. So hopefully the other the other formats are doing well too. Like I, I really enjoyed drafting, so there's always that. Um, but yeah, as, as a Commander and, and Drafter player primarily, I'm, I've been very happy recently. Well, let's jump into our top 10 list, and we are starting things off with an uncommon, of all <laughs> things, Seder Enchanter. So, kind of the new Enchantress, a green-white Enchantress. I know, Tomer, you have an Enchantress deck, or some sort of enchantment deck. Is this a card that you're uh, looking to slot into it? Uh, yeah, that, 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 that's why it's here. I mean, <laughs> it, it, this is a staple for the Enchantress deck, and like, I have an Enchantress deck, but it is a... Uh, an archetype that um, has seen play quite a bit in, in Commander. It's never been as popular as, say, Artifacts, but we have, like, uh, what's his face? Oh, no. Oh, no, the Returned. He was the commander from Commander Lake 2016. He had an experience counter. He was Orzov. And, oh, and uh, da Dax Daxos? Dax is the Return. Exactly. You'll edit it to make it sound good. <laughs> Yeah, Dax is the return. Uh, was Enchantress. We've had nibbles of, of Enchantress every now and then, like Ural the Miststalker is usually like Voltron Enchantress. We also have Sagarda Enchantress. I have a five color Corona Enchantress. So it, it's, it's, it's around. It's an archetype that people know of. And this is a staple in. It's very boring. All it just, it's, it's one line, one sentence, two lines. Whenever you cast an enchantment spell, you draw a card. And yet, it is going to be an auto-include in all Enchantress decks that can play it going forward. So that's really cool. And I should also mention at this point, this top 10 is just my favorite cards that I'm excited for. 
and not particularly like a top 10 most powerful cards because if we're doing like top 10 most powerful impactful cards maybe Saturn Strainer might even be even higher but this is a pretty simple straightforward effect so start so it off I I got to ask you Tomer we have now with Seder and Shanner uh, we have Enchanter itself we have like Eidolon of Blossoms Vidurin Enchantress Enchantress's presence there's a lot of these effects mm -hmm. uh, is there any risk that we have too many like if you're building Enchantress or whatever in commander do you just play all of them even if you have like 6 or 7 or 8 of these very similar cards that draw a card whenever you cast an enchantment um, I mean, we are at like six, so you're right. We're getting kind of to a point where I would start considering maybe replacing an Enchantress for a better Enchantress. I think the top two, in my opinion, for an Enchantress deck is probably Eidolon of Blossoms because it's a creature so you can recur it easily, but it's also Enchantment itself. So it benefits from a lot of enchantment synergies and also Enchantress's Presence, which is just an a enchantment form of this type of enchanter effect. So again, it benefits more from the deck itself. Um, and then you, when you go to like the non-enchantment creatures, those start to get a little bit worse. Um, and yeah, we're at six. I'd run all six <laughs> with no issue. But if we get to like 10 or maybe even eight, I'd start considering cutting some of them. And this, it does seem better than some of them, because I think, like, uh, Mesa Enchantress and, is it Verduran Enchantress? The green version of Mesa Enchantress. Mm -hmm. They're the same mana cost, where they're three mana, but they're zero twos, I believe. So, you are, like, I don't know how often that's relevant in a game of Commander, like, having two power on the battlefield, <laughs> but... It is, it is the an power upgrade, creep. like, in some <laughs> sense, yeah. So you can actually ping in for two and maybe kill someone with Seder and Janner, which isn't going to happen with Mesa and Chantress, for example. That, that is a good point. I mean, I rarely attack. I just like drawing cards. So the zero two doesn't really bother me too much. <laughs> but I can see it being kind of relevant. Like, maybe you, you do want to attack once in a while if the, the opportunity arises. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you, you, you can play your Corona and name Seder. You yeah. just get in there. Yeah. <laughs> Go Druid Tribal. I don't know. Uh, yeah. All right. Let's move on to number nine on our list. And we have a dinosaur, Runic Armazor. And this one, more card draw. Did you just, <laughs> did you just look through M19 and take any card that could draw a card and put it on this list? <laughs> it's starting to see that, see that way, right? <laughs> Uh, so what do you, what do you want to do with this one? Is there uh, is there any specific deck this is good in, or do you just play this because when your opponent cracks a fetch or when they uh, activate a planeswalker or do anything, you're getting card advantage from it? That's basically it. You just you you nailed it on the head. Um, it's it's basically a very good meta call. It's kind of like writing Misk Remora in a play group. Sometimes it's amazing. Mr. Grimora lets you draw a card uh, unless an opponent pays four each time they cast a non-creature spell. So if you're in a playgroup with a lot of non-creature decks, um, non-creature heavy decks, uh, Mr. Grimora is going to be very, very effective. But if you're against like creature heavy decks, Mr. Grimora is not going to be as effective. Uh, similar with Runic Armistar, this is very much based on your particular playgroup if your playgroup is running usually like a full set of fetches and a bunch of creatures or lands that have uh non -act activated non-mana abilities then runic armistar is going to be insane it's going to draw you a ton of cards and it's going to be the type of card that your opponents will have to really expend a lot of resources to destroy as quickly as possible and it's this is just a three mana card it's also a pretty decent blocker too it's a two five for for three so it can block kind of like like the early mid game uh, creatures fairly well too, so I think it's mostly going to be uh, medical. If your if your play group runs a lot of fetches, Runic Armistar is going to draw you a lot of cards in green, which is great. Um, and if you just want to jam it into any deck in particular, Dinosaur Tribal is going to love this. Dinosaur Tribal generally has a higher converted mana cost and also doesn't have like the largest card pool at the moment. It's mostly just Ixalan. So Runic Armazar is an auto clue there. It's a little bit earlier of a play. It's a high quality dinosaur, which again is not, is very important when you don't have a huge pool to work with. And it's just going to be a really good, uh, card that will sometimes draw you a card, but it, it really depends on the play group how good this card is. And that makes it really interesting to me. So. 
for me, my primary playgroup is Commander Clash. Yeah. And you know the decks that we play on Commander Clash, and also Commander Clash returning soon if you're waiting for that. We're about to kick off the new season in, like, next week by the time this goes up. Oof. But anyway, in our Commander Clash playgroup, how good is this? Like, is this a card? I'm building my Commander Clash deck. Should I be playing this if I'm playing a green deck? Like, is it good enough in our playgroup to make it an auto-include, or what do you think? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think it's a little bit worse in our playgroup, just because we don't often run a very expensive mana bases. We're usually sticking towards the cheaper come-into-play tap dual lands, um, and we're not running okay. fetches. We're not running, like, shocks. We're not running duels, uh, the original duels. We're not running, like, the Onslaught and the Zendikar type uh, fetch lands and stuff like that. So it's going to be a little bit worse in our play group uh, in general, I would say. But, it's, I mean, I think it's, it's still worth trying out every once in a while and seeing what, what happens with it. Well, let's move on to number eight on our list, and this one caught me by surprise. I had not considered Desecrated <laughs> Doom really being a commander card, but Tomer, what are you doing with uh, with this artifact? So there, it, it's it's weird because this is the type of card that really interests me, but I'm not really sure how best to abuse it myself. Um, there are some decks, however, that are going to have some fun with it. Um, basically whenever you can like make at least three bats off Desecrated Tomb, I think it's starting to get very interesting for me. Um, some decks like Shire Shiza's Caretaker, I hope I'm saying it right. Um, it, it's a legendary creature. It's going to really take advantage of Desecrated Tomb. I, I have a vivid rem memory of Shire just like destroying us in Commander Clash or just like going off in Commander Clash, basically sacrificing all their creatures each turn and then returning them all back to play each turn for value. Desecrated Tomb, you're going to be making bats at the same time. So that's going to be amazing. Marin of Clan Meltoth, you're always returning uh, a creature each turn at the very least, and you're probably returning a lot more at the same time. Um, if you have the enchantment Tortured Existence, um, it's an enchantment where you can play one black and choose a, and discard a creature card to return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So you can like basically play one black mana and uh, make a bat creature token and just keep doing that repeatedly for every single black mana you, you pay. So there's, there's a lot of synergies here. I'm not sure what are the best decks that are going to take advantage of it, but those are just like a sampling of what I could think of myself. Yeah, I mean, I guess that makes a lot of sense. If you have repeatable ways like Tortured Existence where whenever you want to, you can just kind of make a bat at instant speed if you need to chump block a big commander or even eventually go on the aggressive, it does become a lot more appealing. Um, I don't know if it's worth it in decks where you're just getting one bat per turn. Yeah. I think for me, because I was thinking like Madrotha or uh, any of those type of decks where like, oh, sure, you're casting a creature from your graveyard each turn. You get a bat. Like, that doesn't seem all that appealing. I think you really want to have, like you mentioned, a repeatable way to do it over and over again to make it worth playing in your deck. And I just, I'm not 100% sure like you said, what the best way of going about that is, but it definitely is one of those cards uh, that gets you thinking about it and brewing around it, and it could end up being very good in the right shell. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, I alter my opinion based on what you just said. <laughs> one bat per like entire turn is probably not good, but I think in like Shire, for example, at the end of each person's turn, making a single bat token is probably worth it for, for three mana. So if you have a shell that can really abuse the amount of tokens it's generated, it can get really, really good. All right, let's move on. Number seven on our list. We have our first Elder Dragon, Vivictus Asadami, the Dyer. And uh, this one I assume that you're planning on using as a Commander Tomer, or is this a 99 card? Honestly, I think it's both. Vivictus has a really, really uh, in-depth triggered ability. It's basically kind of like a chaos warp for every single player. You're basically, what you're doing is you're going to make each opponent sacrifice the best permanent that they control. And you're going to sacrifice the least important permanent that you control and everybody's gonna reveal the top card of their library and if it's a permanent they put it back they put it into the battlefield i think even just like playing this without actually building around it's a very powerful effect because odds are you're always going to come up ahead you're, you're destroying an opponent's best thing 
and you're destroying your worst thing and then hoping that the top card is going to be better than or like worse than their best thing and better than your worst thing. You know what I mean? I didn't explain it well, but you know, <laughs> I, I, I know, I know what you're saying. It's definitely very powerful that it can hit any permanent. So uh, you can hit enchantments, you can hit artifacts, planeswalkers. So that's definitely an upside. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, like you said, if you're hitting your opponent's best thing, you're likely, at least most of the time, going to give them a downgrade. And if you're hitting your worst thing, like maybe you have way more lands than you need, you're at least you know, giving yourself an opportunity to upgrade a relatively useless land into a creature or into something else that's powerful, so. Yeah, and I think once you start building around Vivictus, it gets a lot more interesting. Um, I know everybody is very fond of Lantern decks, but Lantern of Insight, each player plays with their uh, top card of their library revealed, and you can sacrifice it, uh, the Lantern, to make a target player shuffle his or her library. Well, if you play Lantern of Insight and everybody shows the top card of each of their libraries, when we when you have Evictus, you know exactly when you actually uh, want to be attacking with Evictus and using its triggered ability or not. Uh, you you have more control over what your opponents are going to, going to flip up. And uh, also, if you have own any top deck manipulation of your own, Sylvan Library, Senses Divining Top, uh, Brainstorm Effects, stuff like that, Scroll Rack, um, you can manipulate the top of your library to make sure that you're hitting something really good when you're uh, destroying some one of your own permanents. So there's a lot of uh, cool synergies that you can start building around for Vivictus. And probably if you want to go all in with Vivictus too, you can build like a clue deck, for example, or like random, a, a token deck is probably more likely. You make a token deck, you, you trade your 1-1 one, one for like a Blightsteel Colossus that you put on top of your library with a scroll rack. Stuff like that is going to be really fun. A worldly tutor for like, I don't know, uh, some giant big thing like a crater hoof behemoth. You know, so there, there's there's definitely an opportunity to make Vayvictus a really good commander, and I wouldn't be sad to run him in, in the 99 as well. Yeah, it seems very strong. It seems like there's a lot of cards that are already good in commander. Like you mentioned, some of the tutors that are putting cards on top of your library. There's random green creatures that also do that, where you can, uh, like, brutalize or exarch or primal command. There's a lot of ways to manipulate the top card of your library, and I think then you're pretty much guaranteeing that with just one or two attacks, you're going to have a huge advantage. Like, even if your opponents run somewhat well and hit a useful card, which isn't going to happen all the time because a big percentage of a commander deck is lands and mana rocks, but if you're setting that up so you're getting your best thing or one of your best things, it seems like Vivictus is going to take over the game maybe in just one or two attack steps, and it's especially scary with all the... Uh, equipment that are already staples where you're putting a lightning greaves on it or something and just doing this every single turn so i think it's going to be a really fun card to build around and like you said it's probably fine even if you don't build around it just because the ability to get rid of your opponent's best thing it is so powerful and it's just so flexible and answers so many different problematic things yeah like the ability to just repeatedly get rid of opponents maze of its and cabal coffers and then you want to get in- rid of an enchantment or a creature over and over again it's so flexible i would be happy to run vivictus in the part of the 99 of any deck that can consistently give vivictus haste which is basically really easy for red decks because you have fervor effect and then you also have lightning greaves like you said um and then if you run him as your commander you can start going into like the full top deck manipulation mode maybe run like a bunch of tokens make a token deck and turn those tokens into giant threats, make like indomitable creativity dot deck with Ve- Ve- with Ve- Victus at the helm. So there's there's definitely p- potential here. Well, let's move on. Number six on our list. We're heading to the world of kind of wacky enchantments, Liliana's Contract. So this one, it immediately reminded me of Power of Promise, or mm-hmm. Promise of Power, rather, where you're getting this massive boost of card draw for five mana, but then it also has this weird demon text that can ramp randomly win you the game so uh, for you tomer is this a card draw spell or is this like a demon tribal win condition uh both and it's also just it's just so weird that you could just win the game with a card that is actually 
fully playable without that second paragraph. Like, if Liliana's contract didn't have the you win the game clause of the at, in the second paragraph, this would still be very playable as an enchantment that draws you four cards and makes you lose four life for five mana. It's a, it's a step down from Promise of Power because Promise of Power is five mana, draw five cards for five, and lose five life, I think, and then it has an entwined cost to make a demon. Um, so in a vacuum, Promise of Power is a little bit better, but Liliana's contract is an enchantment, so if you have, if you're in like Daxos to return or any sort of deck that abuses enchantments, Liliana's contract gets a lot more interesting um but yeah so just the first paragraph is really good draw four cards lose for life for five minutes that's solid I'm, I'm happy and then after that you can also just randomly win the game if you have four more demons with different names which i mean most decks are not going to be able to do it's mostly just a demon tribal type thing or maybe rakdos uh lord of riots might have enough demons randomly to um, trigger that ability, but it's going to be mostly like the the coolest win condition, uh, most on theme win condition for Demon Tribal. But you don't even have to do that. You you could just cheat. You could just run conspiracy and make sure that all your creatures are now demons, or arcane adaptation and make sure all your all your creatures are demons with different names and, and win that way too. So it's it seems like a, a you win the game card that's probably the best we've ever seen in terms of playability. Yeah. So. Uh, I've played a lot of these kind of cards, probably about any card that can win you the game in a weird way we've played eventually, yeah. and this is certainly one of the best, because normally with these alternate win condition cards, the cost is they're really, really bad unless they're winning you the game. Like, you're playing underpowered, do-nothing cards, and hoping you can achieve this goal that lets you just win the game out of nowhere. Liliana's Contract, like you said, draw four, lose four for five mana is already I would play that without the extra text <laughs> on it. And that's not even including the fact that you can, like, Brago it or Flicker Wisp it or, like, do some tricks to keep having it enter the battlefield to draw more cards, which mm -hmm. sounds even more insane. And then it's really easy to accidentally win the game. You mentioned Conspiracy as just a two-card combo. And then if you want to, you can go really deep and play, like, Kindred Dominance and some of these other Creature Type Matters cards. Now that you've turned all your creatures into demons, you can blow up everyone else's stuff and protect yourself with some of the weird stuff that we saw <laughs> with the latest commander deck. So I think this card's actually very, very strong. Like, I think it's very good, even if you're not planning on winning the game with it, or even if you're playing just conspiracy as like a backdoor, sometimes I'm going to draw it combo kill. I think it's definitely worth the slot in a lot of decks. Yeah, I think my favorite way to that I'm going to try and win the game with Liliana's contract is... Conspiracy and Arcane ad Adaptation are cool and they're uh, really easy to pull off, and, but they're enchantments and they're sorcery speeds usually. My favorite way to win the game is let's say you're like a dragon tribal deck and at instant speed you're playing the Ur Dragon, you drop Lily on his contract and everybody's like, all right, well, when, when he drops Arcane Adaptation, then he's going to be a problem. But then, at instant speed for one blue mana, you can cast Artificial Evolution and change the text of target uh, spell or permanent by replacing all instances of one creature type with another. You do that right before your like right before your upkeep, and then you just win the game. You change <laughs> you change the, the word demons like dragons, and you just win the game. Oh my goodness! Oh my that, goodness, Seth. <laughs> that sounds spectacular. You can also, like, this might be one of the best shapeshifter tribal cards we've ever gotten. Yeah, you just go change like tribal or something. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, definitely, definitely a fun card, and I expect that I will be building around it soon. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on. Number five on our list, we're returning to the land of Elder Dragons with probably my favorite Elder Dragon from the set, mm -hmm. Arcades the Strategist. So our new wall tribal defender tribal commander. What do you think about this one, Domer? Well, I really like Vavictus, but I, I agree with you, Seth. Arcades is probably my favorite Elder Dragon Um of the bunch, of the entire cycle, just because Arcades brings basically a brand new archetype to Commander, the entire format. Uh, he makes, he alone makes Defender Tribal a viable archetype to build around, a viable tribe to build around. 
Um, he does so many things for Defender Tribal, and the tribe really needs help. It's it's not a good tribe, okay? It's it's not a great tribe. It doesn't have any. It has very little, very very little inherent synergies. Um, so it was not in a good spot. And before we had a kind of like pseudo Defender Tribal commander with Doran, the Siege Tower, and basically what Doran does is it basically says that all creatures deal damage with their toughness instead of their power. And that's a good step because most defenders are going to have very, very high toughness and low power ratios. That's kind of their thing. Um, but Doran doesn't let defenders attack. And it's and Doran certainly doesn't draw you a card every single time a defender enters the battlefield. So it's okay, but not very good. And you have to take extra steps to actually win the game with defenders with Doran. And Doran is mostly like a tree folk commander anyway. But now we have Arcades. And Arcades does everything. You can, your defenders deal damage with their toughness instead of their power. They draw a card when they enter the battlefield and they can actually attack, which is you, you, you can actually win the game with defenders and Arcades and that's it. That's all you need. He's the only defender support card you need on the battlefield to actually win with defenders. That's, it's fantastic. Um, he's in three colors. Uh, white and green are the most relevant for defenders I found, and blue is mostly for a couple extra support cards and 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 drawing cards, which is always really nice. Um, so he just brings a lot to defender tribal. He makes it viable. I wrote an entire article on him, a budget article on Arcades, how to build a defender tribal. If you're interested in that, um, yeah, he's just, he's just really good, and he's only four mana, and that's crucial too because you need to you're gonna have to replay him a bunch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, it seems like just such a fun card to build around. The fact that whenever you cast a uh, defender, you get to draw a card. If it's a huge deal, it's cheap enough that you can keep recasting it. And then it does give you a way to win the game. I think I've been playing, oddly enough, uh, Defender Tribal in Pauper. And there's some cool Oof. tricks that you've picked up. It's actually really easy to go infinite if you use Freed from the Real on one of your... Uh, there's uh, several defenders, like Overgrown Battlement is one of them, Axe Guardian is another mm -hmm. one that tap for mana equal to the number of defenders you control. Yeah. So if you can get like a freed from the real or another way to continuously untap one of those creatures, really easy to make infinite mana. There's also some sweet stuff you can do with like mnemonic wall and ghostly flicker. Once you have all that mana to keep getting back ghostly flicker and flickering something, which is going to draw you a ton of cards yeah. because you have arcades. <laughs> so you're just going to go through your entire deck. And if it's like a wall of omens, it gets even crazier because you're drawing two cards. So I think, how good will this deck be, Tomer? Like, I think that's the question. Is there any chance you're going to actually win with the Defender deck? Or is it just, like, a really fun, budget-friendly deck to brew around? Uh, I think it can be it can be semi-competitive and, like, low-tier competitive, depending on what type of build you go for. If you're just going for a straightforward uh, Defender beatdown deck, we have walls. We Okay, we have walls that are dealing like there are zero sevens for two mana. We have a couple of those. We have a zero at eight flyer for two mana. So imagine dropping like a wall or a zero eight, a zero seven, a zero six, and then dropping Arcades and then attacking with all of them. You're, you're dealing a good amount of damage very quickly. Like they're huge powered creatures if you get to use their toughness uh, for their power for attacking and they're allowed to attack. Uh, it's no joke. They can really just crush the competition uh, very quickly with, with just a straightforward beatdown strategy. But like you said, there is also potential for combos with um, the defenders that can tap for mana. You can use stuff like Intruder Alarm or Paradox Engine, stuff broken, stuff like that, to basically cast spells, uh, generate extra mana to cast more spells. Arcade is letting you draw cards as you're casting more defenders, and you can combo off and like just like mill out all your opponents or Blue Sun Zenith them or, or do a, a whole number of things to win the game with just like combo strategies. So there's definitely potential there. The only problem here is that the deck is heavily reliant on Arcades himself, and he is he is four mana, so you get to cast him a couple extra times in a general game, but your opponents are going to be very much aware that if your Arcades is taken out of the game, your entire deck uh, really goes back into the Stone Ages, essentially. Any, any savvy playgroup is going to attack Arcades or any or any playgroup that has lost to Arcades is going to 
Like, just make it their number one priority to get Arcades off the table, because then your walls are basically bad. <laughs> so, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's definitely very true. Arcades is super scary. Although, like, there are some backups. We do have Assault Formation. We do, we do have Rolling Stones, which is probably the worst of the bunch. So there are a few ways to help make up for it. Plus, we were talking about how walls are weirdly good at making mana, some of them, even mm-hmm. apart from the ones that tap for mana. You have, like, Wall of Roots that makes mana, and I think there's another option or two out there that I'm not thinking of. So that kind of helps with the recast your Arcades, is you have this, like, natural on-tribe ramp in your deck. But I think you're very right. It is going to be a deck where if you can't get your commander to stick on the battlefield, you're just going to be stuck playing all these creatures that can that can attack and look very, very bad as your opponents are playing real cards. <laughs> let's let's move on to number four on our list, and we actually have an entire group of cards here. This is Cheating. the new <laughs> zombie tribal cards from Corset 2019. So, Lilian Untouched by Death, the new zombie-centric planeswalker, open the graves to make a bunch of zombies, uh, stitch your supplier, <laughs> I guess, if you want to mill yourself a little bit, and you like having one ones on the battlefield in Commander. What do you, th- what do you think about zombies in Commander? Domer. All right, so I cheated a little bit. We usually do a top ten, and I was like, ah, I don't want to talk about all the zombies. So I, I, I threw in like I think I think I threw in four. There's three here. It's fine. Whatever. <laughs> uh, mostly the most important uh, card here has to be Liliana. She is fantastic. She's the best planeswalker for zombie tribal ever printed, in my opinion. Um, all her abilities are very relevant. Um, put, milling yourself is kind of what you want to do as zombie tribal because you want to fill your graveyard as quickly as possible with lots of zombies because zombie tribal has so many, uh, so much access, so many different cards that are basically mass reanimation for them. They have zombie apocalypse, which returns all zombies, uh, from your graveyard to play and you destroy all humans, which is awesome. Uh, patriarchs bidding, uh, living death. There's, there's a whole bunch of abilities that just take all your zombies in your graveyard and put them into the battlefield. So milling yourself and putting those zombies into the battlefield, into your graveyard as quickly as possible is something all zombie decks kind of want to do so her plus one does exactly that and and she drains your opponents um a little bit for it too her negative two is really relevant too it's basically a repeatable removal and then her negative three which you can use immediately synergizes very well with zombies because again you're gonna have a bunch in your graveyard that's what zombies do but there's one enchantment in particular a rooftop storm which is a staple in all zombie uh, tribal decks it basically says you can pay zero mana instead of casting paying the mana cost of of your zombie card so you can essentially cast your zombie creatures for free. So you negative three uh, Liliana with Rooftop Storm on the battlefield. You just cast all, all the zombies <laughs> into your graveyard and put them all to the battlefield. It feels like cheating. It's, it's so good. And she doesn't even die when you do that. She's just a negative three. She's still left with one. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So good. Definitely combo potential. Just a solid card for zombies in general. What about the other two? Uh, Tomer, are they like, how good are they? Like, obviously, if you're playing Zombie Tribal, Open the Grave seems pretty fine. Like, even if it's just Wrath Protection, Removal Protection, maybe you slot in some uh, combos where you're Grave Crawlering with Ashnod's Altar and going Infinite or something. Uh, And Stitcher Supply, that's just a support card for the most part, just another way to get those zombies in the graveyard. Yeah, they're less important than Liliana, but I figured, like, if we're talking about Liliana, I wanted to mention a couple other zombie support cards that I'm interested in. Open the Graves, like you said, is probably going to be mostly um, board wipe protection. Like, you just mass reanimate all your zombies, and then somebody has to board wipe the game or else they lose, essentially. So, making an extra, like, 2-2 black zombie creature token army isn't too bad. And again, like, there is potential for um, combos if you're doing something like um, Astronaut's Altar plus Nim Death Mantle plus <coughs> anything. And you get to <laughs> and you get to combo off that way with zombie creature tokens. Um, and Scissor Supply I thought was a little bit interesting. I'm not sure if it's great, but it's something I'm going to try out. 
Uh, it's a one mana zombie, relevant for zombie tribal, and it, it mills yourself. It starts the milling as cheaply as possible, I think, for zombie tribal. So that's kind of interesting. Well, let's move on from the world of zombies to the world of artifact synergies. Number three on our list. <laughs> Tomer cheated again. Two cards. <laughs> Yay! Psy Master Thopterus, also Tezzeret Artifice Master. So some really powerful artifact centric cards. Are these going in a specific Brea type? deck tomer or uh, <laughs> what are you thinking with these honestly i think that these two cards are going to fit well into basically any blue artifact deck that can have them um Psy is just a great engine and any artifact deck is going to be spewing out a lot of artifacts onto the battlefield as quickly as possible your ramp is all mana rocks and you have various ways to untap your mana rocks to make more mana so you can just like spew out your entire artifact filled hand and when you're doing that you're making all these one one thopter artifact tokens so they're good chump blockers but you can also use them because they're artifacts for all these various artifact synergies and again if if you have extras lying around you just draw cards off them that's a lot of value for just three mana and similarly with tezzeret artifice master in an artifact deck you're paying five mana you're immediately drawing two cards with his zero ability or you're making chump blockers or fodder for your skull clamp or whatever. I don't know. Um, so I think I would just throw these into anything, any artifact deck. Obviously, you mentioned ba Brea. I think Brea is kind of like the de facto artifact general now. Just because she's four colors, she's arguably the strongest of the bunch, most combo potential and everything like that. So why wouldn't you play Brea is, is mostly the question these days. Um, so they'd slot into Brea decks very easily. I'm most interested in running them in a Thopter Tribal deck because I love artifacts, but artifacts are generally a little bit too powerful as an archetype for the, the play groups that I play in. So by toning it down, by playing uh, a tribe that's considered janky, but actually surprisingly pretty powerful these days, Thopter Tribal, you're kind of like restricting yourself, but you're still making a very powerful artifact deck that it has like a janky side to it. Yeah, I love both of these cards. I think Tezzera is super powerful in an artifact deck. It's so easy to just draw two cards a turn, which is a kind of ability, like, when you look at Tezzera in a commander context, you don't think, oh my god, I gotta do something about that or I'm gonna lose the game. You're like, oh, okay, it makes a Thopter, it draws a couple cards, but mm -hmm. drawing two cards a turn is such a huge deal. And then Psy gives you great defense. It can eventually go on the offensive, and it has some sneaky card advantage there as well, where you can turn these random thopters or other like somewhat useless artifacts into card advantage so two great ways to just tur uh, churn through your deck i think thopter tribal definitely makes sense but like you said they're just strong enough that if you're playing an artifact based deck and you have blue mana these are just two staples i think it, it seems like they're the kind of cards you'd have to have a good reason not to run in your blue base artifact deck yeah, absolutely. I think Tezzeret, like, the only reason why you wouldn't run Tezzeret is if you're, like, a very fast combo deck and drawing two each turn for five mana is too slow for you. But otherwise, if you're going for, like, a regular paced um, artifact deck or a grindier artifact deck, then Tezzeret really shines. And Psy just feels like... He, he reminds me of Tower and Sky Summoner, where you're paying four mana, and whenever an instant or sorcery, you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you put a 2-2 two -two, uh, Drake. Uh, but Psy is cheaper and has artifact synergies because the tokens themselves are artifact creatures. So it just feels like there's, even for combo decks, I'm sure maybe Psy even fits into certain combos for artifacts. It just seems like an early game chump blocker that makes all these tokens and has so many various synergies there that... It's just really exciting to me. Let's move on. Number two on our list. We have more cheating. Dragons. Yay! All the Dragons <laughs> cards from Corsa 2019. Uh, our new Tibble, probably better known as Sarkin. Oh Lathless, Dragon Queen, Dragon Sword, Spit Flame. Tons and tons of Dragon cards. So Dragons are already pretty popular in uh, Commander, right, Tomer? Yeah, they're, they're one of the most popular tribes. And... I think Wizards kind of acknowledges that by uh, by trying to print a dragon in every single set. I think that's kind of like their design philosophy is every single set must have a dragon. And then sometimes they're like, you know what? Let's throw ex some extra bones here. Core set. Let's go. Let's go full dragon tribal. Uh, we're cons again. So uh, we got we got a great uh, a great horde of of dragon cards to add to your 
um, to your, add to your Ur Dragon decks or, or any type of Dragon decks, really. Uh, Sarkin Fireblood. I'm sad that he always gets compared to Tybalt. He is so much better than Tybalt. Just his plus one is so much better. His plus one is rummaging. You discard a card, and if you do draw a card, Tybalt's ability, I don't even know what you'd call it. It's just bad. It's just, it's horrible. You draw a card, and then you discard it at random. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, it's basically like him to twerking yourself repeatedly. Oh, it's so <laughs> bad. It's like, you can't even, it doesn't even have a name for that type of effect. It's so bad. It's like a mistake. I would call it mistake looting. <laughs> I don't know. They, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it's definitely better than Tibble. I definitely will admit that. I think it's funny to compare it to it. And I actually think in Commander, Sarkin's badness is maybe his greatest strength. <laughs> the fact that you mean he has this stereotype of being Tibalt level bad. Who's going to spend time attacking your Sarkin? Like, who's going to care when you cast that? And then all of a sudden you're going to be like, add two mana, cast this massive yeah. uh, Elder Dragon or Lathless or something, and your opponents are going to be like, oh my god, I maybe I should have actually cared about that Sarkin. Honestly, I think people are going to kill Sarkin when they have the chance, because I played Tybalt multiple times on Commander Clash, and despite being awful and almost always working against me, people still kill Tybalt. I'm not sure why, but maybe they had a chip on their shoulder from their experiences playing Tybalt, and they had to take it out on my Tybalt. So they kill Tybalt, they're gonna kill Sarkin, and for for very good reason. Sarkin's an excellent, excellent card. Probably, I would, I would, I would list him as like the top three best um, mana rocks at three mana for for uh, Dragon Tribal. And that sounds more vague than I wanted to do. <laughs> Not the, the greatest stance. Maybe I'll say top two. Top two best three converted mana cost uh, mana rock for, for Dragon Tribal. Is it is it better than Dragon's Horde? What's Dragon's Horde? Oh, oh. <laughs> we'll edit that out. <laughs> I think it's better than Dragon's Horde by, by a wide margin, actually. Because, uh, so Sargon's ability, his ramp only affects dragons, but in a dragon tribal deck, that's not really too much of a downside. And if you don't have any dragons to uh, cast with Sargon's ability, you can always just rummage and find one. Um, and Sargon's rummaging ability also synergizes really well with uh, dragon tribalists. Uh, the Ur Dragon and more importantly, Scion of the Ur Dragon. Both of them have access to black. Scion of the Ur Dragon is a reanimation combo deck. So if you're pitching a really big dragon with Sarkin's loot ability or rummage ability and then casting Animate Dead to immediately bring it to the battlefield, that's a win win. Ur Dragon as well has a lot of big dragons. You can discard one and if you have a, re a cheap reanimation spell in your hand, then you're just kind of setting it up with Sarkin. That's amazing. Um, his plus one ability um, is also mana fixing. Ur Dragon and Scion of the Ur Dragon are both five color decks. So being able to mana fix with two mana is, is fantastic for both those decks. Uh, I think it's a superior Urza's Incubator for the tribe because Urza's Incubator uh, reduces the cost of the chosen tribe by two mana, uh, but dragons are so expensive that you're often not casting more than one dragon per turn. So Sarkin's ability is basically equal to that in terms of how much mana it generates for you and it manifests, so it's amazing. And again, uh, you're plus one-ing all the time. And he is a Planeswalker, so he's vulnerable to removal. However, you're in Dragon Tribal, so if you're casting dragons, you probably have enough blockers to defend him. So I don't think that's that, that big of an issue. And then his negative seven is is not going to just randomly win you the game, but it, it's going to get there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's 20 flying power for the ultimate, which mm. isn't bad. That's a lot of value for, for three mana, I think. <laughs> that's true. I think... And it's probably safer in Commander. I think my concern with Sarkin, as far as, like, standard and other formats, is it feels like you're going to play it a lot of times, and since it doesn't really defend itself, mm. it just it gets attacked and immediately dies, and maybe you get one loot off of it or something. But in Commander, people aren't playing Goblin Guides, and, you know, one mana, two twos, and things like that as often, so I think it's a little bit safer. And if you do untap with it, then you're playing a big dragon on defense. Uh, what do you think about the rest of these cards? How good is Lathless, uh, Tomer? It seems very powerful, but it's not really something you can probably play as your commander, right? You gotta be multicolor, most likely, to be really a dragon tribal deck. Well, I mean, there is one 
dragon tribal commander in mono red that I really like. It's not Lathless. It's actually Zerillion the Claw. And I always feel bad mentioning Zerillion because he's a really fun commander and he's uh, a great deck to build around. Basically, you can use him as like a, a sneak attack for dragons. And at the end of turn, instead of being um, sacrificed or destroyed, the dragon is exiled. So you have various ways of like tucking your dragon. I think there's like Telgiad Stylus or something. You can like uh, shuffle a permanent back into your library so you can reuse it afterwards. Um, there's cards that basically stop your turn and your turn early. So the triggered ability doesn't happen. Like you can cast it in response. I forget the name of it, like Sundial of the Infinite, I think. So there's, there's various ways to build around Zerillion uh, as like a sneak attack dot deck for dragons, and it's really fun. However, he is on the reserve list, so eventually he's just going to be priced out and nobody's going to play with him anymore. But for now, he's relatively cheap, and he's he's fun as a mono red general. I like him more at, than Lathless, because Lathless is kind of bland in terms of what she brings to the table, and Zerillion is more of a build around unique uh, ability. But I would like Lathless in a Zerillion deck and also as part of basically any dragon tribal list. So again, mostly you're going to be the Ur dragon or a scion of the Ur dragon. Um, she generates a lot of, of value for you. A six mana, six, six flyer is already pretty good as an attacker and blocker. But then as soon as non-token dragons are entering the battlefield under your control, you're making five, five dragon creature tokens. So it's, it's very similar to like Udvara Hellkites where whenever a non-token or no, whenever a dragon attacks you make a 6-6 six, six, uh, dragon token um, so the more dragons you cast or the more dragons you attack with the more dragons you make and basically Lathless and Invora Hellkite tell your opponents deal with this in the next turn or two maximum or I just win the game that's what Lathless does it basically it, it tells your opponents you have to deal with my board right now or else I'm going to win the game in the next few turns and also she has like a little anthem ability too that you can pay extra mana to give all your dragons fire breathing, which is also a nice little way to really drive that point home. What about spit, uh, spit flame? So four damage to a creature for three mana. Like, it's yeah, right. I guess it's okay. You get it back, which is, I guess that's something. Like, is that a dragon tribal staple? Or is this kind of like, eh, you're playing budget. Maybe you need the removal spell that's on theme. It's not, it's not on budget, but like, I, I wanted to talk about Sarkin. I wanted to talk about Lathless and Dragon's Horrors. And Spitflame, you, you, you correctly, uh, picked out as the weakest of the bunch by far. Um, it's good as a way to pick off utility creatures like an opposing Oracle of Moldiah or something like that, or some smaller utility commanders uh, repeatedly. Uh, the, if the game goes long, then you get a lot of value out of Spit Flame. Um, but if you want like just a very effective, uh, cheap, uh, targeted removal, you're probably going to want to run like Sword of Plowshares way before you want to run Spitflame. It really depends on the type of play group you're with. If you're on the more casual side and you want a more thematic deck and games go long, then Spitflame can do some serious work. Um, but if you go for a faster type of game and you don't really care about the theme too much, then you go for like some, something like Swords of Plowshares or Snuff Out or a bunch of other things because the Ur Dragon is five colors, so you have access to literally everything. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Number one card on our Corset 2019 yeah. Commander list cleansing nova we've been talking about a lot of spicy cards but man this card is just very good it's like a, a stir command or an additional stir command which is a staple so tomer is this where does this rank on the wrath list you're building your commander deck you got to put 10 wraths at least in your deck is <laughs> this the first the first one the fifth one the tenth <laughs> one where does it fall in the hierarchy of wraths so we're building mono white wraths <laughs> And we want That's to make like sure the next over. yeah we want to make sure the game goes at least an hour extra. Uh, cleansing Nova, I would say, is like top top four, top four favorite uh, mono white rests in in Commander for me. Um, compared to Austere Command, Austere Command is more modular. You can destroy some creatures and some artifacts and enchantments. Um, so there are, there's some, I mean, you, you could do, you could do more 
interesting things with austere command uh you're going to get more ahead with austere command usually but austere command does cost an extra mana cleansing nova is kind of like that sweet spot between wrath of god at four mana and austere command at six mana it's modular but not as modular as a six mana austere command it can destroy all creatures um, but it's more modular than Wrath of God, which is one mana cheaper and also gets around regenerate, but that's not really a thing anymore. So that's less relevant these days. Um, and it's, it's that sweet spot. So I would say that I like Austere Command a little bit more than Cleansing Nova because I'm in most games, I'm okay paying an extra mana to have more value or more options available to me when I'm, when I'm wrathing the board. Um, but Cleansing Nova, I probably like more than Wrath of God, to be honest, in, in just our type of games and Commander Clash type of games, slower grind your games where you can get more value off your higher converted mana cost spells. If I'm like at a super competitive table, then I'm going to have to go with Wrath of the God just because it's the cheapest option. And if, if I need a Wrath ASAP, then that is the only option available to me. The, the, the cheaper, the better, but at, at a typical semi-competitive of playgroups, I would go Austere Command, then Cleansing Nova, then probably Wrath of God, to be honest. Yeah, I think Cleansing Nova is very good, especially for Commander. This feels like a Wrath that's almost specifically designed for Commander, because in Standard or Modern, blowing up all artifacts and enchantments is kind of meh. Like, sure, in the right matchup, it's great, but in Commander... Those cards are staples, like every deck, essentially, or close to it, is playing mana rocks, playing some sort of powerful enchantments pretty often, so it's a very powerful Wrath for the Commander format, and 5 mana to blow up all creatures isn't bad, like it is 1 mana above Day of Judgment Wrath of God, mm. like the absolute cheapest effect, but it's Commander you're playing, and uh, like you said, it's definitely worth it to pay 1 extra mana for that flexibility, outside of everything but maybe the most spiky of Commander tables, so I think it's card it it will essentially be in every white deck i build moving forward yeah i can imagine just for my board wipe slots for any white deck i would go austere command and then cleansing nova and then depending on the type of deck i would probably run or uh our revelation as my third one but i mean most decks want at least two board wipes so that means cleansing nova is going to show up in most of my my white decks which is insane. Like, this is going to have the biggest impact. Of all the cards in M19, Cleansing Nova is going to have the biggest impact on Commander in terms of, like, sheer playability and number of times you're going to see it in a, in in games. Uh, Cleansing Nova is definitely the winner here. Anyway, I think that brings us to the end for today. So, Tomer, like usual, thanks so much for hanging out. It's always so much fun. Thanks for having me. I love doing these videos. And thanks to everyone for listening. So let us know what you think. What are your favorite cards from Corset 2019 for Commander? What other decks do you want to build? The rest of the Elder Dragons, all that stuff. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. And we'll be back in a few weeks to talk about Commander 2019. So until then, we will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.